Good evening, everybody. My name is Kenneth Pruitt. I use he, him pronouns. Welcome to Poetry at the Point Online, uh, a monthly reading series organized by the St. Louis Poetry Center. I'm super excited to be with you this evening for our June reading, our um, Pride Month reading, our barely not Juneteenth reading. Um, I'm really excited to be with Stephanie Russell, Raphael Maurice, and Noelia Serna. Say hi, everybody. Hello. <laughs> St. Louis, a uh, few quick announcements before we get rolling. Same as last month, wanted to reiterate that St. Louis Poetry Center turned 75 years old this year. Uh, so in addition to our new look that you hopefully see on your screen right now and uh, on our social media um, accounts, we also have some activities in the works that will launch in August, which is just a couple months away. So uh, look for updates. Um, on social media, and then we'll also announce our plans for returning to in-person events. We hope, 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 fingers crossed, uh, that this reading series, for example, will be back in person in September. But uh, keep your eyes on the internets for that. Want to thank our many members and supporters at the St. Louis Poetry Center. You can become a member at our website, so check that out. Big shout out, as always, to our supporters, and particularly the Missouri Arts Council, uh, whose big, big, generous support helps to make this series possible each and every year. Um, so speaking of social media, if you're watching this in real time on Facebook Live, pretty please comment and share the link. Um, but if we have time at the end, which we have over the last few months, we're gonna have some informal Q&A with these lovely poets. So uh, if a question pops into your brain, please post that in the chat um, so that we can pick that up and use that when we have some conversation with these folks. If you're viewing this after June 22nd, pretty please still comment, still share. Uh, we want to keep boosting the signal for these folks' work uh, and for this reading series in general. We will also post some links on Facebook for you to support these poets and access more of their work online. So keep your eyes there also. All right. So without further ado, let's get to the real business of the evening, which is poetry. So first up this evening is Stephanie Russell, the author of Inferna by Intagliata Press in 2013, The Possum Codex from Otis Nebula in 2015, and uh, um, 47 Incantatory Essays, which was actually my first introduction to <laughs> Stephanie's work, which came out in 2019 from Spartan Press. She was also the 2018 Lawmeyer Sculpture Park Poet in Residence, um, which makes me more jealous than probably anything about her. Uh, you can find her online at stephanierussell.com and on the Twitters and the Instagrams. Um, please welcome Stephanie Russell to the stage. Stephanie, go right ahead. Thank you, Ken, and thanks to Aaron Quick and to the St. Louis Poetry Center and to Noelia and Raphael. And so just a quick introduction. <laughs> I have a theme for tonight. So. I woke up yesterday and came down my stairs and looked in my yard and saw that the storm on Sunday night had just completely decimated one of my pawpaw trees. <laughs> it was just uh, lying in the yard like that. So that's how I started the day. And I ended the day with this terrible uh, dishwashing accident. My beloved glass citrus juicer fell into the sink and lots of shards of glass ricocheted <laughs> off the sink and got me in the hand. So look at this nice finger. I have bandaged, I had to go to urgent care because it bled and bled and bled and bled and they had to put some kind of medical styrofoam on it, I guess. So, uh, so it's no longer bleeding, that's, that's great. I'm very happy about that. So I thought I would theme the reading tonight, uh, sort of the uh, dystopian, um, Dystopian Domestica with a 4th of July chaser. <laughs> so I will start with that. A long time ago, every big city had another little city within it, built near train tracks or industrial waterways or dumps. It was where you went after you lost your job and your house, where you patched together shelter from scrap metal, driftwood, and pallets. You nailed flattened sardine cans over holes in the floor. You curled a sheet of rusty tin into a tipsy chimney that puffed smoke over a tar paper roof. St. Louis's ran a full mile along the Mississippi River near the municipal bridge. It was so big it spawned suburbs. Hoover Heights, Maryland, and Happy Land, short for Happy Landing. 5,000 people lived there. 
Some of the buildings were so big they soared two stories tall and had antebellum verandas. There was a scrap metal church and an orange crate church. People sent their kids to school, hung wash, angled for catfish and turtles, walked three blocks to the Welcome Inn where they stood in line under the bridge for baskets of bruised turnips and stale bread. Chicago burned its Hooverville. New York sent demolition crews to Central Park. St. Louis sent a crew of WPA workers to tear down the Mississippi River shanties. And in 1949, 47 families still lived in Parkerville at the foot of, the Mad at the foot of Madison Street. It was at the foot of Madison Street where the city of St. Louis decided to build its new municipal dock and rallied the bulldozers. Parkerville, home to a woman who said, this is the only home I have ever owned. I've lived here for 21 years. I'm going to miss the flowers in my garden. Home to a man who said, I don't want to be jammed up in one of those public housing projects. I wish I could move to the country. Home to a woman who said, what shall I do with my antiques? I'm 80 years old and I've lived here for 28 years. What shall I do with my antiques? Home to Charles Keenan and his wife, who put plastic, not glass, in their windows, who had ragged curtains, whose sink had a worn veneer, whose sink produced hot and cold running water, who read the newspaper in a wallpapered room, who laid down tile in the kitchen and the bathroom, who brewed coffee, who shook out salt and pepper on their dinner, who sat at a kitchen table facing a kitchen window looking out on the river, Parkerville, where men and women sadly and silently contemplated their belongings, trying to decide what to take, what to leave behind, where to go. Parkerville, Parkerville where men and women stared bitterly at the condemnation signs tacked on their homes by the city. Parkerville, which had its mayor too, a mayor who told the reporters who showed up for the bulldozers, it's unfair to make us move but you can't fight City Hall. So I guess there used to be these things, I have only seen them in uh, archives, these things called wish books, which I, they were like catalogs. Um, and uh, so this is, this is wish book. It was like a mid-century thing, mid 20th century. The heart is a little catalog. Sugared oranges and gold papered boxes Marigold and cream and fringy edges. Shoes and shoes and chenille slippers. Lullaby scratched on a cloudy mirror with a diamond stylus. A capuchin monkey peeking over the brim of a silver loving cup. A permalux perfume bar. A pair of galoshes that make you invisible. Transparent velvet capelets and color fast handkerchiefs bordered with household gods. A box of small soaps that smell like everything you remember the year you turned 17. Christmas socks hung over the maw of the heart. The soot is dark and there's a hole, but that's not the black hole. You trade in you. You trade in your you. Then the yawn of want never shuts up. Mother Barbituate sews herself a wallpaper dress. Father Gin and Tonic falls asleep at the table. Little brother eats pepper from the shaker, the grim mantle where the ashes of ancestors settle. The ghosts swirl in the bottom of the teacup, throwing fortunes, rearranging the tea leaves, playing a banjo made of tortoise shell and hemp with hemp strings, stirring the ashes in the fireplace, drawing hexagrams in the dust. The moats don't know where to settle. One day you'll kite out of this kitchen by combusting in the firebox. Your magic door is the mailbox, a book of longing sleeved in brown paper. So, okay, these aren't so domestic, I lied. <laughs> In an old Pokeberry church on North Broadway, the Reverend Dithyram belts out an orphic lecture from a battered blonde dais. 
wearing a gold tie printed with instructions on how to navigate the afterlife. He tells us how a persimmon is a small orange heart with pictures inside describing the weather or what we'll have to do about the weather. The spoon for heavy snow, the fork for light snow, the knife for cutting winds, a fruit that knows three words for winter, three seed pictures, a way of talking itself through till spring. Or else we humans, as we always do, have reduced its tongue to near nothing, to signs that point toward what matters most to us. He says, who says persimmons just talk blandly about the weather? A spoon could be a flood, a fork, the devil, a knife, death. Two. Up at the creaky pulpit, the Rev thumbs through a thrift store reference book looking for the directions to his favorite exorcism. He's versed in peep stones, has a mad stone for your rabies, says eggs carried in a man's felt hat always hatch as roosters. I sit in a folding metal chair, red yarn tied in a bow around my neck. Everyone here can smell some spirit's coppery carbonated breath. Last Sunday during coffee, my neighbor's mother hollered for everyone to gather. In her pink gloved hand, she held out the receiver of the payphone in the foyer, a terribly wrong number, a wall of static and purling, punctuated with creepy whispers, dogs barking, ear-splitting whistles, ghost stories on the party line. Into the booth our rev went, sweat, sweaty, hanky to his forehead, finger signing three sevens over his chest. Now listen, oh, you sons and daughters of earth and starry heaven, he said. Don't make me dial O for operator. Call up big O to sing his hymns. He moves stones with high pitches, plucks thunder and lightning like strings, and totally knows how to banish the dead. So uh, <laughs> Kenneth wrote, yes, with lots of S's. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Oh, and Aaron, oh, oh, I see all these things in the chat. I'm not gonna get distracted. I'm, I'm, I'm moving on. I have two small poems to end. One is about the four pictures for a doll, the photo booth. <laughs> it's called Four Little Histories, and then I'll end with a Fourth of July poem. One, in the train station photo mat, a quarter dropper waits. He escaped the backyard where his Tesla coil hums setting all the dogs in the neighborhood off, barking. Blue electricity tinsels his hair. Oh, that was one, two, three. This is the third picture. He shivers in his brown and plaid overcoat, the one with the frayed collar. His pockets are full of aluminum shavings. His head is uncovered. Four, his winter hat, the one lined with squirrel fur, rests upside down on his lap under trembling hands the fur standing on end. Second strip of pictures. One, a middle-aged woman in a blue smock dress appears gray in photo. Two, after her third stop today at the Moldorama kiosk. Three, in her hand, a newly minted tiger looking lumpy but ferocious. The wax is still soft and the tiger has a thumbprint on his forehead. Four, she brandishes the tiger at the camera as if it were an Oscar. Three, the bicycle eater ran away from the Coney Island Midway. Two, he is breaking his contract. He poses in front of the painted palm trees because he has 50 cents and a face. Three, he bares his teeth and takes a bite from the rubber bulb of a bicycle horn. Four, chews with his mouth open with the delight of a kid who's just popped a balloon and chaws the fragment of a broken of the broken rubber just to hear it squeak. Fourth strip of photos, one. She has a sparrowy kind of face you wouldn't remember without a picture, which is why she's taking a picture. Two, she's holding up a number rose which has four hearts and four crowns of pollen and one bloom smells like four. Three, 
First there was the soldier, then the baker, a butcher, an accountant, but not a candlestick maker. So in her other hand, a candelabra. Four. This is the way she looks as she remembers a rare miniature rose variety called Why Not? Okay, and the last one is a 4th of July poem. Uh, how it explodes. One, color. Glittering willow and lemon and green glitter. Reading color peony, crackling rose garden, 40 shot powerhouse of absolute whirling white, galactic rainbow, fire invincible, 13 inch flaming wheel of destruction, gives way to the blue and starry diadem, dragonflies welcome spring, this side up. Two, shapes. Roll the tubes with black flash powder, aluminum shavings just for sparkle, bundle by the hundreds in glassine packets, sew together with raw match, banger, cracker, waterfall, blue comets can only be rolled by hand. The effect is a large star rising, brocades burn longer than Camaro stars. Three, type. Supercharged magnesium and plastic, clustering black, black clustering bees rocket, loudest available by law. Do not store in pocket. Ne pas porter dans vos poches. Supercharged, super strength, extra noise, light fuse, haul ass, and run. Moon travel with report. And that's all I have for you guys tonight, me and my busted up finger. <laughs> so thanks very much, guys. Awesome. Thanks so much, Stephanie. You, so for those of you watching, so what you don't know is that there is a, a chat that we can see um, and communicate with each other that you cannot see. So Stephanie was <laughs> checking out, um, and it's fun to um, go go nuts over the just the sounds and images of your your poems while you were chatting. So that's what you are seeing. Um, I I'm gonna um, sit with antebellum verandas for a very long time. So um, thanks very much, Stephanie. I really appreciate it. Um, next up, speaking of fireworks, uh, is Raphael Maurice. Check out that backdrop. He is a translator, writer, and poet. Uh, he tutors full-time at East Central College, where he also teaches. His forthcoming book, Against Music, is out on Spartan Press this month, so go and, go and get that. He is also the author of The Idiot's Calendar from Spartan Press as well. And there is a part of his bio that he left out, although I've seen it all over the internet, which is he lives in Washington, Missouri, where the river keeps its secrets. So I'll sneak that back in for you. Uh, Raphael, take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Kenneth. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Stephanie and Noelia. Um, Stephanie, that was gorgeous. I don't know what to say, and I don't really feel like following it, but I shall. I have to. Um, the first poem, I guess I'm going to read, um, it, it, uh, it's called Trailer Trash, and um, it's based off the song by Modest Mouse. It even has the epigram, and I'm sorry if I dissed you for those of you who know early Modest Mouse, late Modest Mouse, you can skip. And it, it's really just a poem about being young and, um, and not living the best life. So, um, so here, here goes trailer trash. Yes, can <laughs> A German called out more light when he was croaking. I coughed so hard last night. I was only joking. And the German had a good idea about plants. But there were boys when I was a boy. We took a magnifying glass and roasted ants. They'd sizzle up. We were all teeth somehow, boys, and spit brown juice into cups. And we all wanted to kill each other. And in the sun, we meant it strange to want to end our dirty, frayed lives, busy killing ants. We'd cry out under clotheslines worrying mothers to a tread. We were boys and their violence, my own violence, my hands, our greasy hands, light, more light, 
In the fireflies burn and press, we buried our dead. The next one, I'm, I'm looking for it, but the, the next one I'm going to read, um, I, I wrote after I met my wife, Christina, and um, so, sorry, I'm, I'm searching for it. So, so, um, and we had just met, but we're, I'm going to be a father soon, so therefore she'll be a mother. And uh, I, I wrote this, I guess, hoping it would be the case that uh, this would all happen. But it was, it was I wrote this a few years before um, any of that was to be. And it, it, it's called Mother's Day Sonnet. It's just 14 lines and, and yeah, uh, Mother's Day Sonnet. But I, I was surprised that th this came to be um, and, and jo joyous over it. Uh, Mother's Day Sonnet. Little light inside her, that's what you are, a little light, a terrifying bloom. But I will keep you. Tight as a well-made line, the laundry line stretched through the night. My mother sways beneath. And my money will blow in gusts. Blue breezes made to hollow out accounts. And I will be afraid. I will grieve some for the things I've wasted. For lights I've extinguished, stubbed out. And the lights I've lit up. And seen swarm my pinwheel sugar loaf. Honey, dear, land into our arms and squall, summoner. Um, this next one I'm going to read is um, it, it's not it's not that it's so interesting that it's true, but the aspect of it that's true is is really amazing. Um, a young boy I went to grade school with this was in the first grade our teacher announced that his arm had been taken off in a combine and that he carried it back to the farmhouse on his own and, and got his mother in this case and then, then went to the hospital. But I, it was truly astonishing, obviously, but just how brave Aaron was and, and uh, the boy who lost his arm. And I, I was just astonished that someone could have that in them. And, um, uh, what a what this is just dedicated to, to Aaron and just what a brave, brave, tough person. This is called Sneer. With each oyster like gob that comes de profundis, with phlegm that coats the side of my hatchback, I feel disdain, but for life now. I sneer and I smoke like a pool hall bitch. I sneered too when I was asked to snitch on boys who beat off in bathroom stalls. You could hear them, their final squalls. They rested their heads on desks in math. It was after lunch, then home where there was a cold bath waiting to, for their backs to receive strokes of leather belts. I think of them. I smoke and think of Aaron his right arm vacuumed off in a combine. He was reported not to have cried out, but fetched his ruined limb. The boy carried it back to the farmhouse. How he'd smoke in stalls. How the crows that day must have spread like India ink, their cause from tree to tree. How different everything must have been, standing on the corner of this and that. I wear a Stetson and pull down on my hat and wait for a stranger to pass by. I still get paranoid when I get high. I touch both arms with both hands. Like some ruined, rained on puzzle, there are pieces missing. I walk, light up, and think of boys running through the gym, high as kites, singing something about rubber and glue their high tops squealing above the impossible brightness. Um, I'm just going to read, I guess, two, two, two short ones, really two short ones more. And uh, that will be that. Um, 
Sorry, not familiar with my own book, it appears. Um, okay. uh, this is called The Piano, and it, it, I should have put a dedicatory note in it. It's for Glenn Gould, the pianist. And every time I hear him, well, every time I listen to him on records and stuff, he, he reminds me of just a barroom player with the grace of a truly just genius classical musician. And I wrote this just listening to Glenn Gould play and thinking about him playing and what a wonderful person it seemed he was. The piano. The sudden ear, electric and astonished. Somber, I am told, rhymes with you, hombre. I think of a shadow, long, the shadow that rules my life all unmarried. Bachelors run merrily from their wives. Quel dommage. I lost my summer millionaire by December's dark gray road, my sudden ear green and bent. Ombre, words lift. Where's the money that I spent? And always here, just be here. Words riot the summers up the air. A million bees now gone, honey bear. Thank you, Master Ombre. Penumbre scatter into the mouth of the breath of the clutched heart of the Christ breathing out the world. And bless you, skeptic. Thank you, O oh voice, notes over the sound of these heavy keys. Uh, one last one. And uh, this, was a, this was about uh, staring out when I lived on Cherokee Street, just staring out at the night sky when I had an abscess in my mouth. And um, it's, it's called Adventures in Dentistry. I had just been treated for the abscess. I'm, I'm not belly aching, but uh, the, the stars looked particularly beautiful that night. And um, as a matter of form, I was just reading Michael Robbins and W.H. Auden, and I totally ripped off like the rhyme, and, or I tried to rip off the rhyme and syntax of that sing-songy, sing-songy poem with, with trouble behind it. So yeah, this is called Adventures in Dentistry. And thank you so much. When my tooth was yanked out, my mouth turned violent. The dentist, Dr. J, broke the bank. I doled out with Percocet. The print was blurred on my gazette. Sipping whiskey through a gauze strain, gum, I spaced out to cars, swimming just out the door. Easter would come just after Lent. Four roses burned like an open sore. I thought about cigarettes, and I was angry and had no rent. You were angry as I rinsed and spat. Out of the sewer crawled the rat, its belly bloated, translucent, smooth. It shivered and crept down the sewer grate. Overhead, the stars cooed. They were candles dying out, reigniting. I wanted them to flame until our streets were clean. I wanted the stars, almost cold enough to eat, to burn out until there was nothing left. Thank you. Thanks very much, Raphael, for um, sharing your poems with us. I'm going to make you tell us uh, at the end how you actually saw stars on Cherokee Street. So um, <laughs> be thinking about how you're going to lie your way through that one. Um, I'll all jokes you. aside, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Last up is Noelia Serna, um, coming to us all the way from Arkansas, actually, in Fayetteville. Uh, she is a first-generation immigrant from Costa Rica and reserved her, received her bachelor's degree in creative writing from Westminster College. She is a poetry reader and feedback editor for Tinderbox Poetry Journal, an assistant poetry editor for Borderlands Texas Poetry Review, an associate editor for Sibling Rivalry Press, an editor for Nomadic Press, a poetry editor for Patchwork Lit Magazine, a writing mentor, and a recent recipient of the Lengel Raman Prize for Mentorship for PEN America's Prison Writing Program, and somehow made time for us 
Um, this evening, she is barely keeping her gigantic dogs at bay with lots and lots of peanut butter. Uh, and I'm very excited to welcome to our online stage, Noelia Serna. Please take it away. Thank you, Kenneth. Wow, the oh, Stephanie and Raphael, you guys are beautiful. That was beautiful. Everyone pray for my dogs. Um, okay, so first poem. The caller on the crisis line tells me about her trauma and then asks me if I believe it is possible to come back from something that has completely broken us. And I wanna tell her about the dozens of times I have crawled my way out of the abyss, how that first breath of air when your head breaks above the surface of the water feels like God himself is breathing into your lungs, how that singular moment makes you realize what praise feels like. All the times I have held the shattered pieces in my hands, sure that this is how it ends, the kind of pain that makes you wonder if you will ever be able to breathe right ever again, how I am familiar with pain that leaves you paralyzed, the kind that terrifies you because you wonder if you are dying. Is it possible to drown from a broken heart? I want to tell her about the days when hiding in bed was the strongest thing I could do, how I have cried myself through a hundred lonely nights, how I have wrapped my arms around myself so tight for fear of unraveling into ribbons, how pain has been a boulder resting on my chest plate, how many times I have been sure this breath is the last one. I want to tell her about the days I have woken up only to realize I am still breathing, still smiling, still here, stronger than ever before. I wanna tell her about the way you laugh after coming back from something that should have left no survivors, that deep in your belly laugh that forces you to throw your head back, makes you wonder if perhaps you have gone a little mad, perhaps the madness is what helped you survive. I wanna tell her about the times I have looked in the mirror and been shocked at the warrior staring back, how many times I have fallen in love love with the oceans behind my eyes. I want to tell her how much deeper I am capable of loving someone because of how unlovable and broken I have been, how being touched by fire and watching the charred wreckage disintegrate gives you empathy like you have never known before. I want to tell her how you will never truly feel like a warrior until you have returned from the dead with an updated wardrobe, a new hairstyle, a new tattoo, as if surviving the apocalypse is just super casual, just something we do on a Friday night because forget hot girl summer. Coming back from the dead be the best glow up. It comes with a bonus of giving zero you know what's and an increase in don't need no man, don't need no job with that level of stress fearlessness. I wanna tell her that this is the origin story of a true goddess, how these are the things that make us rise to the levels of what we are truly worth. But we are not allowed to share personal details on the crisis line, understandably so. So I answer and I say, yes, I know it is. And this is also truth. It is possible. It is, it is, it is. So I've got one more long poem and three shorter ones for those who like to keep track. This next one is called Liturgy for the Lost. Last year, you pierced your ears. You grew up pastor's daughter in a denomination that taught you your body belonged to God and to men before it could ever belong to you, taught you jewelry was a sin and piercings were abominations relegated to something the lost did. While most of your classmates wore earrings from the time they were babies, here you are, 34 years old and still learning how to navigate the holes you chose less than a year ago. There are times you feel less than, times when you have to ask for help getting an earring in. There are the really beautiful but big earrings you purchased but are still too afraid to wear. There is beauty in fear, in knowing you are not ready, but you can choose when you are. Religion robbed you of choice for so long, taught you men could say what was acceptable for your body, do with it what they wished. Yesterday, you cried. 
because you couldn't get your left earring to cooperate, had to call your best friend, have her FaceTime you through it. No, this moment is still a choice. Know that renovations require moments of breaking today. You arrange the new earring stand you bought, carefully place the studs, unwrap the heavy pairs of earrings you so carefully curated as you look at the happiness on your vanity. Remember the years you would stare at your classmates' ears longingly, knowing you could rock the earrings they chose to wear, the jewelry they didn't have to hide from their moms, how you dreamed up the outfits you would wear, if only. No, this is celebration. Breathe in the choices you have made for yourself. You were once told your body was a temple. This was the reason you were indoctrinated against piercings, against tattoos, against choice. Remember when your Bible was written, only men were allowed to be priests, so it is only fitting. They believe themselves gods, made you believe choice was a desecration if it be defilement by man then let it be called worship. If by you, let it be called abomination. When you are ready to wear the biggest pair of earrings you own, remember to brush back your hair, extend your neck as you walk and let them swing. Let them be pendants, let them be flags, let them be beatitudes. Blessed are they that renovate temples for they shall rebuild peace. This is how temples are reclaimed how holy ground is restored. Let the congregation of those still in captivity say hallelujah as you walk past. Let them say God has brought them out of their captivity and she be looking fine in some earrings. Let the flash of color from your ears show them a taste of holy. Let the temple be restored to its former glory. Let the people say amen. I've got three shorter poems. This first one is called The Morning After I Let You Go. I stepped onto the porch and noticed that the strawberries you planted had withered. Their shrunken black husks retreating into the yellowed leaves above. They had been fine yesterday. I remember seeing the flash of red when I let the dogs out right before rushing off the porch as I have done since the day you left, standing out only long enough to hook the dogs to the lead line before fleeing your ghost, the one that haunts the place where you lied, told me you were ready for forever, that you'd always be there, the place where I once believed. The only plant left is the one I chose that day at the greenery, the day you jokingly said any living thing I touched would die, as if the universe waited until I was ready to let go to remind me it was time to stop watering what was his, to remind me it was time to turn the faucet onto myself, onto the patches of dry grass he let choke under the harsh sunlight of untreated addiction and inability to commit her. I scooped the strawberries from their pots place them gently in a bag, lay them on top of the gardening trash pile, a burial ritual for everything I could have made bloom had the soil been ready, thank them for holding off until today, watered the remaining plant, told it the drought is over, the rain is coming. All right. Two more, two more. This is called Love Letter to the Immigrant. Yes, you, the one holding fragments of an evaporating language beneath your tongue, crossing oceans so your children could break barriers instead of soil, to the mothers, talking, tucking pieces of their native tongues into their children's backpacks, to the fathers, trading master's degrees for chicken plants, to the children entering classrooms in a country that does not like natural hair, curls, or color. They will call you ugly. Try to wrap your identity within a slur, build cages around you, call you illegal, make fun of your accent and skin color. Remember, when they try to break you, how your ancestors carried the same skin tone, how you are still beautiful. 
Do not let them steal the language from your throat. They will try to convince you that tongues cannot carry two languages. Remember, your accents are landmarks, reminders of the homes left behind. Remember, every piece of identity you keep is a connection to home and to those that came before. Remember that seeds do not concern themselves with how deeply they've been planted. They simply take root and bloom. Last one. Thank you all so much for holding this space for us. This is called Walking Our PTSD. The puppy is afraid of the trash truck. The way it clangs metal against metal against the darkness of the early morning. He is afraid of the electric box disguised to look like a rock. The one that marks the halfway point of our walk down the street. He is afraid of recycling bin lids, disabled dachshunds, and the friendly dog that wags his tail and barks a greeting from across the yard. I feel him pull against his leash to cower behind my legs, but never lose my temper. Instead, I kneel down, blow kisses when he whimpers, hug him when he quivers. I too know what it is like to be afraid of things no one else can see. Sometimes trash trucks can look like monsters in the dark. Sometimes fake rocks can hide dangers only I can sense. Sometimes recycling bin lids can be holes in the sidewalk. I call him sweetheart, kiss his muzzle, knowing I am afraid of the sound of keys and closing doors, knowing like him I am afraid of life's normalities, how I always wonder when someone tells me they're going to the store, how many times it will take before they don't come back anymore. The puppy is not the only one that spends his days staring out of windows looking for the car that holds the one he loves to return. My recycling bin lids are the extended silences of a phone that does not ring, my fake rocks the temporary goodbyes that feel like forever, my trash trucks the emptiness of cold sheets on the other side of the bed. When I wake up alone in the middle of the night, I know what it is like to hear bombs lurking beneath the singing of birds, what it is like to hear the helicopters and blaring sirens despite the peacefulness of a normal Wednesday night. I kiss the puppy tug gently on the leash and tell him he's coming home with me. I tell him I love him and that I am right here. I tell him we are going home. And a part of me wonders as we finally continue our walk if I am reassuring him or myself that someday someone will see the fear and instead of running will tell me we are going home that I am loved, that they see the trauma but are here to swim against the only stream I have ever known, so we walk. His tail begins to wag, thumping against my leg. I blink back tears as he gratefully leans against me and wish for a reassuring love like mine for him. We walk past the fake rock and the puppy walks past with his head held high, a sign that even the deepest fears can be soothed. Thank you. Thanks so much, Noelia. Really, really appreciate that. And thank you for um, yeah, mentioning that we are trying to hold space for, um, for this amidst the end of this wacky pandemic. So we have um, our other poets coming back up and uh, we're gonna start with some um, question and answer time. And uh, one thing that I did not prep you poets for, which I will mention now <laughs> to give you a little time to marinate on, which is, uh, at the end, when we close, I want to give us some time. Uh, I'm going to steal a practice from Al Phil Reese, who uh, hosts a podcast with the Poetry Foundation um, called Gathering Paradise, um, an opportunity for us to uh, shout out something awesome going on in the poetry world, a book or a, um, a podcast or a reading series or an organization or something in the literary world that is really giving you life right now. So kind of marinate on that a little bit because I want to close up. Um, with that. But Noelia, I'm going to start with you because you got a question um, in the Facebook chat, which I'm sure, you know, if you're like me, you could take years to answer. But the question is, uh, where does the energy and fire in your poems come from? This is from uh, Khalifa Mitchell, who may or may not know you. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think a lot of it is just a sense of urgency. For me, 
my goal in my writing is to try and connect with people. Um, and I have a background in crisis intervention work, um, mm. obviously that first poem. And it's almost an urgent work to tell people that they're not alone, that our traumas don't define us, that we are, humans are the most resilient. Um, people will go through the most horrific things and just come out a million times more beautiful and more powerful. And I think for me, I want when somebody hears me read to feel like I can get through whatever it is that I'm sitting with in this moment. And if that mm. is the only thing that I can convey to them in my writing, um, it's worth it. And so I, I want them to hear that. Um, so I guess at the crux of it, that's where it comes from. That's really interesting. You know, I'm... Um... I am. I work in healthcare, and right now I'm in the middle of taking some um, trauma-informed care training. Um, and what's really stuck with me a lot is um, our need to kind of shift in our culture from asking what's wrong with you to asking what happened to you, right? Which I think for a poet is just a much, much more interesting um, question. So. Um, yeah, can you guys see me or hear me now? Yeah, but I think we lost Noelia. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, cool. Well, I hope we get her back soon. <laughs> I'm glad she had the opportunity uh, oh, to answer. You. There she is. Um, anyway, so yeah, what happened to you? Seems to me a much more interesting question for a poet to answer. I wanna offer to um, to Stephanie and Raphael too. Like, I mean, I, I guess the question is really kind of almost like an artist statement, right? <laughs> like, um, what is your poetry about these days? If you had to kind of summarize in a sentence or two what your, what your poetry was trying to get up to in this moment, like, what would that be? <laughs> Raphael nodded at me very subtly. <laughs> <laughs> Passing the buck, is that what that was? You know, the way I write, it's so weird. Like, I'll start with an image or some idea. I mean, I really like to write about people, too. I get really bored with myself. I'd rather write about other people. Um, but, I, I mean, honestly, I never know what I'm going to write about. I have to follow the thing. Like, the thing leads me forward. I I mean, I, I'm completely always clueless when I start and and... I was actually working on something tonight that I didn't feel ready to read. There was this woman, her last name was Walsh, but she, in the St. Louis Public Schools, they called her Miss Wash. She was the shower lady because a lot of people didn't have bathrooms in St. Louis for like, you, hmm. there were bathhouses and you would go to school to take a shower and she was the shower lady. She would help you with your towel. And she did this for, gosh, like 40 years. Like, what is it like to be Miss Wash? <laughs> yeah. I don't know until I follow Miss Wash down the corridor, like with her pile mm. of towels and, you know. So for me, it's really, I, I have to follow the thing. The thing comes and, and kicks my butt and tells me mm. where I'm supposed to go. I'm completely subservient to it. Yeah, that's fair. Raphael, what about you? Um. At the risk of sounding like a politician, I'm going to have to kind of agree with Noelia and Stephanie um, in the sense that Stephanie says it's the thing that, I guess if I may paraphrase, you, you're you subservient to it. And Noelia is indicating that you, you try to write things that, you know, humans are resilient and you want to let them know they're resilient. And maybe just by by capturing something even gruesome, or hard or difficult, maybe you're letting people know that you, you know, that they're not alone. And um, for a long time, and it, it's gotten a little, not nuanced, I don't want to water it down, but it, for me, this was just what it, it was in a sense pen, penance because um, whatever you feel about God or, you know, it, it's almost irrelevant. You can even just take God as a metaphor, but it's just the betrayal and the, the 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 frivolous things we say at night or during the day and our jobs and the, the stuff that feels so inauthentic. It just sometimes you're even 
it's almost like you, you couldn't make a good act of contrition or a good confession for a lot of reasons. But the main reason is, is that so much of it is out of your, your say. And so for me, so, some of writing poetry is, I guess, directly devotional hmm. in so far. It's just, I, I do care about the characters, put it that way. So I, I hope yeah. that kind of, Sorry to be long in the tooth, but yeah. No, not at all. And you've, you know, you've mentioned religion, which came up um, a lot this evening. I'm wondering if anybody wants to bite on the bait of, um, you know, how does meditation, spirituality, even like very specific religious characters, um, you know, when those, when those folks show up, Stephanie, like how, how, how delicately do you have to follow them down the hall, right? In order to kind of um, get what you need from them. Depends on who it is. Sometimes it's not so delicately. Sometimes you get dragged by your collar down the hall. <laughs> and other times you're just sort of mincing behind them. And I don't know. For me, it's always just like very much in the moment. I don't know how it is for these guys, but hmm. yeah. Uh, so you guys, Noelia and Raphael should jump in. And Yeah, Noelia, you had that poem that we were, I was loving in the chat, by the way, um, which was very, very religious. Talk to me about how you, um, especially, and, you know, I'll just, you know, point to the elephant of just in 2021 where religion has just been, it's so politicized. It's so divisive. It's so... Uh, it feels like we've forgotten how to talk about religion in ways that are productive. I, I say that as a former ordination process dropout myself. So I'm curious kind of how you how you do that in a way that is um, both authentic, but inviting. Yeah, I think it, it comes down to just being honest. Um, I know growing up very, very religious in a very um, constrictive religion for most of my life. Um, there was a lot of struggle against it, a lot of pushback. Um, mm. And I, um, I, I, like, I like Stephanie's answer of it depends who you're following down the hall. I remember um, when a relationship ended, I, I wrote this poem about, I, I wrote a poem to speaking to Bathsheba and it was this poem that just came out of desperation. Like, I feel like I chased her down the hallway trying to ask her these questions that I had. And so for this poem, um, the one that you're referring to, Kenneth, it it was mostly just, I want, I want to be honest with the audience about my struggle with against religion and, and trying to wrap my brain around it now that I, I call myself a, a reformed, you know, Adventist. Um, I'm a recovering Adventist. And um, it's it's just kind of just putting it out there and saying, hey, you know, it was rough and I have some scars and, and that helps people connect instead of trying to tiptoe around it, mm -hmm. put it out there, be honest. Yeah. Rafaela, I used your comment as a springboard, but I wanted to hand it back to you if you had anything further to say about that. I'm sorry, that, that cut out just for a moment. I get the general gist, but could you full context? Yeah, absolutely. I was just, my apologies. I was saying that I'd used your comment about kind of religion and spirituality as a springboard for this conversation, but I wanted to see if you had anything else to say. Um, I mean, a, a little bit. I, it, I, I like that Noelia says being honest. I, I can only speak from my myself in this very specific sense that morality is what you do when no one's watching. And I often do what's wrong when no one's watching. And I'm perfectly willing to admit it, although it pains me very much that it's the case. Mm. Um, and that, that that's not making a God claim. That's It doesn't necessarily commit you to theism or anything like that. It's just, which I am, you know, I, I, I you know, long ago mocked God and, and had to be the village atheist and all of that. And that's, you know, that can be as trendy as any form of belief or even gross <laughs> politicized religion. And uh, yeah, I don't like either one, I guess. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've been both of those characters, so I, I get it. Um, so we have about five minutes left and uh, I'm going to, uh, skip to some announcements at the end here. And then I wanna 
give us some time to uh, to gather some paradise, uh, which is in conjunction actually with a question that came in over Facebook chat. So I um, just wanted to uh, let y'all know that the 2021 Nash contest via the St. Louis Poetry Center results are in. Um, congratulations to William Youngblood for his poem, Father, What is the Distance Between Further and Farther? Um, he is reading sometime in the next couple months, actually, at this reading series. Super pumped about that. Um, as well as Brittany Cordera, um, who's one of the finalists with Good Feet, uh, and Matthew Freeman for his poem, Dad and I at the Bus Stop When It's Six Degrees. Uh, you can check out all their poems on the St. Louis Poetry Center's website, and you can hear them reading, as I mentioned, at some upcoming Poetry point poetry at the Point events this fall. Um, thanks to Andrew Matika, uh, and to all the poets who submitted their poems to the Nash contest um, this year. So last question, um, let's gather some paradise. So um, a question came in via Facebook about uh, what y'all are reading these days. So uh, I wanna combine that question with just what is what is happening in your literary uh, spheres that are worth uh, paying attention to? I'm gonna start with Stephanie. Always in the hot seat here. <laughs> <laughs> I have this bad habit of reading like eight books at once, so I'm not going to go through the whole list. Um, but I had a friend who sent me a copy. It's it's a book from the 80s, and it's really it's a novel. It's not poetry. It's called <clears throat> Little Kids, and it's kind of a fantasy novel. And it's just so I think poets really a, it's a, a novel for poets. It's just and and usually I'm a really fast reader, and it, I cannot read this book quickly. It's Mm. weird that way and and it's almost got this magical thing about it so i would highly recommend that book and um the other thing i have been looking at are are oral histories which uh in in archives which i think are just another thing that poets should read because i think both Raphael and noelia were really doing deep dives into other people's lives and i think in terms of like cultivating like just a broader sense of how people are and getting out of your own head, they're a great way to do that. Yeah, agreed. Awesome, thank you. Raphael, what about you? Um, gosh, right now, I mean, if we mean pretty immediate, um, gosh, um, I, I'm promiscuous with my reading too, you know, eight books as Stephanie <laughs> says. Um, <laughs> Gosh, um, I'm reading Francois Mariac, the won the Nobel in '54 for literature. But I, mm -hmm. his novels aren't what really draw me in. I, I like his his study of Christ called, called Son of Man, and mm -hmm. what I'm reading right now is what I believe, and it I, I like that a lot, obviously. But it, it it it's completely divorced from any pretension or trying to be clever or press philosophers or theologians it simply it, it almost starts when he's a boy and goes through his journey with catholicism and it's whether whether you mm. it, it wouldn't matter where you fall in that order whether you it wouldn't matter it's a beautifully pared down simple honest account of where he is and where he was with religion and then mm. Simon Bay's um intimations of uh Christianity and antiquity, which are little short, some short essays ranging from like um, early Greek plays that, and just, I guess like, like early Greece all the way to Christianity, of course, and then to her time. But we often hear the argument like, well, if it's all true, none of it can be true, that sort of thing. And Simone Bay is just so good at like pinpointing, like, no, it's, it's true because it's intimated like it, you know what I mean? Like it, 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 it's not true because it's iterated before. It isn't, you know, you often hear like religion is supposed to fall out of the sky and I'm not making a man a joke, but it's supposed to be so finished and mocked, packaged, but it, it's, that's not how anything is. So yeah, that's what I'm yeah. saying. So, yeah. I love it. I did not expect to have theological book shout outs tonight, but you're making me think of the universal Christ by Richard Rohr. If anybody's into that sort of stuff, hit me up. Highly recommend. Noelia, I'm going to give you the last word. I am also a promiscuous reader, um, and I've been reading Of Women and Salt by Gabriela Garcia. It's it's beautiful. Um, mm. And I have been revisiting uh, Maggie Smith's Good Bones. I can't get enough of that book. And also, 
um, a new collection by Daniel Summerhill called Divine, 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 which is just stunning. Um, so those are not everything that I'm reading because literally it's like an entire shelf in my library, but I, I'm surprised I can remember what's happening in anything, but. Understood. I identify with all of the reading promiscuity. I have taken the pandemic um, as an opportunity to kind of whittle that down, but um, I lied. I'm not going to give you the last word. I have been reading um, a recently published um, kind of revamped from a short story into a novel uh, by Richard Wright called The Man Who Lived Underground, which started its life as a short story uh, in a collection called Eight Men. It's very short, it's about 150 pages, but it is um, absolutely blowing my mind and kind of starts off as um, this um, mid twenties um, black man character getting um, you know, mistakenly accosted by the police for something he didn't do. And then kind of two thirds of the novel is about him um, living literally underground in the sewers trying to kind of escape. And it becomes this really just absurdist kind of exploration about what it means to be um, a black man living in the first half of the 20th century in the United States. So um, flabbergastingly wonderful, highly recommend that, just came out. Um, all right, so our next reading is gonna be on July 27th. Please, please mark your calendars. I'm really pumped about all these readers um, that I'll say a lot more about uh, when we get to it, but those will be Stefan Delbos, Linda Neal Rising, and Jason Vassar along. So please make sure and keep an eye out uh, for that Facebook event on the St. Louis Poetry Center's page so you can share it far and wide, just like this one. Um, and you'll also be able to view uh, tonight's reading uh, on Facebook after tonight. So thanks again to Stephanie, Noelia, and Raphael for sharing your poetry with us. Always a pleasure. Thank you to Aaron Quick, um, our Wizard of Oz behind the curtain for making all of Al Gore's internet uh, work well for us. Uh, thank you to everybody watching uh, and have a lovely evening. Thanks very much. See ya.